Thank you, everyone, for joining today's uh, podcast, which will be, be one part of the series of podcasts. We'll be focusing on the importance of the key parameters when selecting the right photo detector. For today's podcast, we have three person participating. My name is Jake, currently the business development manager at Hamamazu, and I'm the host today. With me, we have Dino and Neil, who are both photo detector senior engineers at Hamamazu Photonics. So guys, just to begin, we know photonic technologies today are enabling more and more markets and applications. I know there's many photo detectors out there for people to choose, and often it creates a lot of confusion, especially with system design engineers who are working and using these detectors to create their system, the different applications. So could you give the uh, audience a quick overview and review the different detectors that are out there first? Well, for the sake of ease in these podcasts, we can stick to basic point detectors or single channel detectors. One of the most traditional and commonly used is the photomultiplier tube or PMT. The basic structure of the PMT is a photocathode that basically sees light and outputs electrons. The dynodes that provide the internal or intrinsic multiplication or gain and the anode which collects the signal to be outputted. Key features for PMTs are the high internal gain and low noise. These key features combined enable very low light level applications and can even do single photon detection. Hey Dino, did you want to explain a little about the solid state detectors? Yeah, absolutely. So there's four main types of solid state photo detectors. There's photodiodes, avalanche photodiodes, silicon photomultipliers, and spads. Now photodiodes and avalanche photodiodes are more established and they've been around for many decades while silicon photomultipliers and spads have just recently become mainstream products in the last decade or so. Now, all four of these products can be made from different materials, but silicon and ingas are definitely the most popular. These detectors all work on the principle of photoelectric effect where a photon with sufficient energy striking the material generates an electron hole pair, which is then measured. And when we refer to energy in this case, that means the wavelength or the color of light. So for example, silicon, operates from UV around 200 nanometers up to the near infrared around 1000 nanometers. And ingas can operate from 500 nanometers up to about 2.6 microns or 2600 nanometers. But ingas is more expensive than silicon, so it's mostly used when the wavelength is beyond the range of silicon. Now the detailed physics of how these detectors work is a complex topic involving band gap engineering, doping concentrations, uh, structure, depletion region design, and so on, but generally photodiodes and its faster sibling, the pin photodiode are gainless. So one electron hole pair is generated for each photon detected. While APDs or avalanche photodiodes operate in the linear region where you apply a reverse voltage to adjust roughly how much gain or how many electron hole pairs you generate for each photon you detect. Now, when you operate APDs above the breakdown voltage, it can go into what's known as the Geiger region where a single photon basically saturates the detector generating upwards of 1 million electrons or more for each photon detected. Now this on its own was very problematic for the earliest APD users because it latches the output to the saturation current like a switch. But by adding a reset circuit, the Geiger effect can be exploited to detect single photons with very high gain. And then we can use the reset circuit to reset the detector to detect the next photon. So this is essentially how SPADs work and then silicon photomultipliers or SIPMs were developed to have many SPADs in parallel to detect multiple photons simultaneously. That was a very good physics overview. And thank you very much for that, that for the different solid state detectors. But I, I do know that right now in the market, uh, PIN, the PIN dials and the avalanche photo dials are very traditional solid state detectors with many usage history already. And they are being used in applications like short range or medium range LIDAR uh, market, the optic communication market for full photometry, and basically any application and market that has sufficient amount of photons are presented in the detection. Now, um, we, the more um, you know, we, we talk about this, the more I hear that you know, uh, people are now really uh, hyped up about uh, silicon photomultiplier, the SIPROMs, or the SPAD. So what really makes them so special in your opinions? Well, Whoa. SIPM, as Dino already described, is basically an array of Geiger mode APDs that operate above the breakdown region. 
and they're all connected in parallel, which give a fairly linear response until reaching saturation, meaning the upper end of its dynamic range. Even though I did say this is an array of Geiger mode APDs or SPADs, each microcell or element is connected in parallel, so this still operates as a single point detector. In terms of applications, some of the ones we see SIP bumps being used are PET, of course, LIDAR, and even moving into other aspects of medical, like hygiene monitoring and flow cytometry. Yeah, and where SPAD really excels is if you have a low noise application or low noise requirements. So SPADs are much smaller than SIP bumps, uh, so their dark counts are also much lower. So we're talking five to 50 dark counts per second for SPADs versus tens to hundreds of thousands of dark counts for SIP bumps. Uh, the disadvantage is the, the smaller active area for SPADs. So active area could be as small as 50 microns in diameter for SPADs, whereas SIP bumps can be as large as six by six, 10 by 10 millimeter, and so on. Um, so some applications where you'll find SPADs would be single molecule counting, um, particle size analysis techniques like dynamic light scattering, and diffuse optics like near infrared spectroscopy, which is often used in functional brain study. Well, that's that's definitely a good amount of detectors for people to select. I mean, uh, so far I see that we talked about pain, PMTs, uh, uh, APDs, ads, SIPOMs. There's so many out there, so it gotta be confusing sometimes for the people to know or the audience to know what is the best fit for the different application. So. What is the best way? I mean, you know, it's so many detectors. What is the best way to choose the right parameter or choose the right detectors to use under the different circumstances? Yeah, absolutely. It's not easy. And to properly select the right detector, you you really need to consider six key parameters. Uh, there's gain, sensitivity, active area, noise, bandwidth, and linearity and dynamic range. Now, gain is, uh, to be more specific, intrinsic gain, uh, basically elevates the signal from the detector. So this can elevate your signal above readout noise. That's the advantage of gain. Sensitivity is a combination of the quantum efficiency, which is the ratio of converting the photons to photoelectrons or output, and the gain. So those two combined, we consider that to be sensitivity. Active area determines the, the collection area for photons. So larger active area means you could potentially collect more photons, if, especially if you're, if you're, you're signal is diffuse um, in nature. But it can also affect noise because larger active area, especially in the case of solid state detectors, can increase dark noise. Now noise, we generally mean dark noise and it's fluctuation determines how low of light levels you can measure. Um, so when we consider dynamic range, that considers both the lower end of light you can reasonably detect and the linearity, upper end of linearity would be the upper limit of how much light you can detect. And that's that's good amount to consider. I, I see why it could be confusing for um, uh, engineers to decide what's the best fit for them. But unfortunately, I guess today we're running out of time for the session. Uh, but just to wrap up, uh, do you guys believe there's a you know key parameter? Is there like one for this parameter that you just talked about? Do you know is there one that's more important than the other, or you know is is there a better detector overall uh, compared to others? Yeah, there's, there's not really um, one key parameter. The relative importance of, of the parameters really depends on your application and, and what you're trying to do. Um, and this this would be a topic of deeper discussion. And but Hamatsu is actually unique in the sense that we're we're the one of the few sensor manufacturers that offers all types of the detectors. So we can have these detailed technical discussions with the customer because we understand these all these types of detectors and the trade-offs for each one in detail. So we can have these detailed discussions to find what's the absolute best detector for your needs. And, and that can vary quite a bit depending on what the application requirements are. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Dino. And because Hamatsu is the only one offering all the photo detector options, we want to make sure to only recommend the detectors that would be the best fit to our customers based on their setup and application. This is very critical since we hear from people like you that some suppliers tend to market and steer the conversations to fit only the detectors that they are offering rather than what is best for the end system. And as everyone realizes, the photonic detector is the critical part of any project and any wrong recommendation often leads to significant project delays, budget overruns, and overall just non-optimal performance. 
that's actually a very good warning to have, I think, for our audience to understand the importance of this topic. And hopefully, you know, everyone that watched this podcast will stay tuned for the next sessions, which we will dive in detail on the key primary, the six that Dino and Neil mentioned. Um, in the meantime, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we will have the contact info on the screen for you, um, as you see. And if you have any questions about this session or in the future on the other sections, or if you want to reach out to ask us about, you know, what is the best way to pick up the right detector from our lineup, uh, please contact us. And Dino, Neil, thank you so much for joining and giving everyone your expert insights. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, absolutely. Always a, always a pleasure. Thank you.